And this panel, as uh, we've said, is going to focus on treatments and the way that these folks are both working with all of the options that Shelley just went through to treat and manage their sleep apnea as well as start to get into the conversation and extend what we already uh, started this morning with a description of some of the barriers to getting uh, safe and effective treatment. So this panel, and I again won't use the names, includes a construction professional turned patient educator, a, re a retired IT professional, a postal worker and community organizer, a Navy pilot and a nonprofit grant writer, and they're going to share with us their experiences. Rick, get us started. Hi, right, thank you, Kim. And again, thank you all for being here. I'll go briefly over my story very quickly. Um, in 1982, I met this beautiful 19-year-old young lady who did later, 1983, became my wife. Well, the first night that we had spent together as man and woman, I wake up in the morning and there's this beautiful young lady sitting on the corner of the bed with this look of horror on her face. And I kind of woke up and looked at her going, geez, it wasn't that bad, was it? <laughs> but she goes, no, she goes, I thought you were going to die. And I looked and I said, why? And she started telling me, you know, I had stopped breathing, I was choking, I was snoring, I was thrashing around. I said, well, that's the way it was. Well, 10 years later, 1992, she comes home from the dentist with an article that she read in a magazine. She goes, here, they wrote a story about you. And there it was. It was all about sleep apnea, and it was about me. So luckily, my primary care doctor at the time, when I went to see him, he hated his prescription pad. He didn't just like writing prescriptions for everything that was wrong. He wanted to find out what the root of the problem was and not just put a Band-Aid on it, but see if it could be treated. So he sent me to a new sleep clinic that had opened up in my town. It had just been open for a few months. So here I am going in and starting to learn about sleep apnea and the masks and, you know, the, uh, every everything about it. Well, I was one of the very, very fortunate ones, and I consider my very, myself very fortunate in the area of sleep apnea, was because the clinic was so new, the doctor we had, Dr. Nichols, never forget him, an outstanding doctor and outstanding staff there. They really talked to me. They let me know what was going on. They let me know what to expect in my sleep test and what, to, and what was going to happen after that. Uh, they even showed me a VHS tape of um, what the CPAP machine was. And back then, CPAP machines were huge. My first machine was the size of a toaster oven with a separate humidifier that had a hose going from one to here to here and another hose coming from here to my face. And, um, Never thought I could use it. And without their encouragement, without the education and training ahead of time, I wouldn't have been able to use it. Well, subsequently had my sleep study. The first night of sleep, 36 years old, was the best night's sleep I'd ever had in my whole life. Absolutely woke up and uh, I was amazed at what a good night's sleep felt. Well, again, as I was lucky, I ended up becoming a case study for this sleep clinic because I was the youngest person they had ever seen with sleep apnea and the most severe case they had ever seen at that time. So I actually had to go back four times before my pressure ended up at just about 17 where they, where they found it. Well, as I went through, it was fine. It did well. I, I felt much better. It worked from the very first night I used it. And I can go on with all the great things that happened, not falling asleep when I was driving anymore, not eating so many chocolate shakes and French fries to buy through drive throughs to try to keep myself awake while I was driving. But one of the most amazing things that had happened, um, working with the American Sleep Apnea Association, talking about some of the things, a few years ago I was talking with my youngest daughter about it. And she goes to me, Pop, don't you, remember, don't you know that all of us remember the day that you started using your CPAP machine? And I joked, and I said, why? Because the house was quieter? She goes, no, Pop, because the house was nicer. And I said, what do you mean? It just kind of caught me. I said, what do you mean? She goes, Pop, the, when you started using your machine, of course, my children were very young at the time. She goes, you were a changed person. She goes, you didn't come home, you know, tired and grumpy and yelling at us and falling asleep on the couch and, you know, all the things that you did. Now you were spending time with us. You had patience, you were reading to us, you were riding bikes with us, you were playing with us. She goes, the CPAP machine didn't change only your life, it changed all of our lives. And which I thought was very, very powerful because I never realized what effect I had on other people. 
I was really, when I look back upon then, I was a pretty crappy person. <laughs> but sleep deprivation will do that to you. It's not that I want it to be that way. And so as we moved on, I was very fortunate to meet and to work with the um, Sleep Apnea Association. I've done many programs over the years to any groups that want to hear what we have to say about sleep apnea to educate about sleep apnea. And the reason for that is, and I think where uh, society is lacking, where the medical profession is lacking, where the insurance companies are lacking, are the, imp are the importance they put on sleep. Sleep is way down on the bottom of the list, okay? We all know, as people who've been involved in it, sleep is one of the three pillars of life. There's sleep, nutrition, and exercise. Without good nutrition, you're going to be sick. Without exercise, we know what happens. Well, without good sleep, you're a crappy person, you know, besides not feeling well. And so uh, the questions that I have to ask, you know, to the people that are out here, and we appreciate everybody being here, is why is questions about sleep not part of a yearly physical examination? Why don't we, st our doctor simply ask that? What's going on? Why do these days, and again, I consider myself very fortunate because I was part of the beginning part of it where when I went through my whole process at the um, sleep clinic and then when my DME brought me my machine, okay, they taught me how to use it. They sat down with me. This is how you put it on. These are the different masks. This is what you do. This is what to expect. Nowadays, DMEs go out, oh, you need a machine? Either they mail it to you or they drop it off. Here it is, Here, here's how you turn it on, see you later. Okay, because one of the biggest complaints that I've heard in a lot of programs that I use is I don't use my machine. I went home to try to use it, didn't like it, woke me up, dried me out, this didn't work, so I just put it in the closet. Okay, we need to have a process and a process ne needs to be established. First of all, find out about sleep. The medical doctors need to know the primary physicians how important the sleep is. Okay, second of all, we need when our DMEs are coming in to explain and to teach people, you know, how to use them. Okay, and to realize. And the third thing is, don't have doctor panels that are someplace over there that are not even sleep physicians decide what's best for a sleep apnea patient. Okay, and just... I will end with what happened to me quickly with an insurance company about five years ago, and I'd already been on sleep apnea for over 20 years, and I went, my new machine came in, my provider billed the insurance company and then said it was denied. And so I went back, asked why it was denied. They said because the panel of doctors, which were established back then, said I didn't meet the criteria, so I put an appeal, it was denied. We finally went back and forth, and I was literally told that this, the panels of doctors are much more intelligent than I am, so I need to stop arguing about it. Finally, I looked at the, uh, talked to the woman on the phone from my insurance company. I said, have you ever looked at my file? And they said, I don't need to. My, our doctors told us what you need. I said, take a look at my file. She put me on hold. Five minutes later, she came back and approved my machine. So we do need to fight these things and to make it easier for patients to have access, education on that, and then access on how to use it, the training, and to get th that part of the profession a lot more into what we're doing with sleep. Thank you. That's all. Southern California. Yeah, un unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, Paul Bloomstein is our local from Annandale, Virginia. Paul, share your story with us, please. Okay, I was first diagnosed with uh, sleep apnea for a little over 15 years ago. I must have had it much longer because I've always been a heavy snorer, and, um, and I think it kept getting worse, and I finally realized that I needed medical attention when I woke up and realized I'd been sitting at a, at a traffic light for a long time asleep and I'm sure glad when I fell asleep it was at a traffic light and not while I was driving. Um, I went to my primary care physician he said it's a possibility you have sleep apnea I'm gonna send you to an ENT he'll probably have a study done which is exactly what happened and uh, I was diagnosed and given a CPAP machine and that made a world of difference in my life because I no longer had to worry about falling asleep in dangerous places or places are embarrassing or maybe even causing me to lose my job if I fell asleep at work. 
Initially, my sleep apnea was diagnosed as moderate, but I monitor it with a uh, program called Sleepyhead, and um, that sh has shown that my apnea is still getting more and more severe over time, and that's become a concern for me. I I'm using an auto CPAP. The maximum pressure that you can set it to, I set it myself, by the way, is, is 20 uh, centimeters of water, and I hit that m top value some, sometimes. Doing some research, I found that the highest machines I can get are automatic BiPAPs, but that still only goes up to 22. So uh, I'll be seeing my ENT in about a month to discuss this with him. I'm sure he's gonna move me to an auto BiPAP, set it to the maximum, and I just hope it doesn't go any higher because then I may need surgery, and that, of course, is, is a concern. Uh, another problem that I've been having is traveling because you gotta drag the CPAP along with your other luggage, you gotta make sure you're sleeping in a place that has an outlet, and, uh, and I always carry an extension cord just in case. Uh, and the biggest problem I'm having post-diagnosis is um, that in the mornings, sometime mid-morning, most days, I start feeling tired. That's known, as uh, the doctor said, as excessive daytime sleepiness or EDS. So what I do is either one of two things. I either take a power nap between one and two hours, and I'm not always in a position to do that, of course, in that case, I take either 150 milligrams Nuvigil, which is the same medication that's usually used for narcolepsy or one of the narcolepsy medications. Uh, however, Nuvigil has a side effect, and that is if you take it regularly, you start getting insomnia. So, so what I do to try to minimize that is not take the Nuvigil if I don't have to, and it went on days that I have to make a judgment call whether I could take half a, get away with half a pill instead of taking a full, full pill. Um, okay, and one more item I'd like to note is I do use my mask every night without fail, no matter where I am. However, when I take my power naps, um, I don't use the mask. Uh, the interesting thing is I don't snore when I take the power naps, and I think it's what's happening is the pressure from the CPAP is compressing the tissues in my uh, throat area, and the one, one or two hours of the nap isn't enough to loosen it up again. So that's kind of nice. And, uh, and the reason I don't use the mask is more, I know it's better to use it, is more for psychological re re reasons. Uh, it gives me a break from using the mask because I use a full face mask and it's kind of like feeling an octopus has clung to my face and I, I just want to be able to sleep once in a while without that feeling. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Next, Celeste James from St. Albans, New York. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I think I'll start with my background. Um, I have, I was diagnosed in uh, 2015 with sleep apnea as a result of uh, having the NYU School of Medicine come into a health fair, this huge health fair that I was hosting at my church. And uh, because I was the host of this big event, I wanted everyone to feel comfortable speaking with the health professionals and the physicians and, you know, Everyone who, who had something at their table that you needed to participate in, I went in and did that thing. So I had my blood pressure checked and my eyes checked and all these wonderful things happening. And the NYU School of Medicine was asking several questions about a variety of sleep, uh, sleep difficulties. And so I sat and answered some questions and made sure that everyone else knew that these were not personal questions, there was nothing here that was going to hurt you, and I sat and answered the questions. And someone pretty quickly said to me, uh, looking at, at my responses, 
do you mind if we follow up with you? And I said, sure, look, everybody, you know, it's not, it's not going to hurt you. Sure, they can follow up with me. And uh, they came back to me in the event and said, do you mind if we get in touch with you about, you know, a further type of study connected to whether or not you might have sleep apnea? So I said, sure, look, everybody, they're going to follow up with me. Never even occurred to me. It was only for other people, honestly, for other people that I did this. Because at that point, I did not know sleep apnea. I had never heard the term sleep apnea. I didn't know anyone. I know now that I know people that had sleep apnea. I didn't, I, I didn't know what this was about at all. So of course I said, sure, come on. So uh, they did, in fact, get in touch with me very quickly after that and uh, asked me follow-up questions and made it clear that there might be something there. Did I mind if we did a home study? Sure, we can do a home study. So they came, put the monitors on my wrist. You guys know how, how this goes. Uh, and very shortly after that, it was clear that I did, in fact, have sleep apnea. And uh, we, did, uh, we did that study where they attach all the electrodes. You know the one where you don't get any sleep that night? Yes, we did that. And I was able to get a machine into my home. Now, I have, uh, I have and I have had health insurance, like I said. I worked for the US Postal Service for 31 years. I retired as a customer relations coordinator. So I, I stood between the Postal Service and uh, act, uh, angry customers and local elected officials, local elected officials and uh, community board members and the borough president's office. I, uh, I serve my community in a variety of ways. I also sit on my local community board and uh, I have been a, a producer and director at Queens Public Television so I get to have an active voice in what my community receives. But, uh, but I, I try to be a, as active in what my community needs as I can be. And so this was a great opportunity for me to experience this thing and to be able to talk about these things. Because like I said, I didn't know anything about how sleep deprivation was going to affect my life and everyone else's. I had no idea uh, about how long I had been, been experiencing sleep deprivation issues until I got involved in this, prog uh, this progress. Because when I got my machine, uh, this was through the NYU School of Medicine and their affiliates. But I can tell you that when I got my machine, there was some sort of difficulty between uh, the, the, the prescription number that the machine was at and what I actually received, because this was not something that I could control. This was something that was uh, programmed elsewhere. And so when I got the machine and I was shown how to use it, my prescription was stronger than what the doctor had spoken to me about. So when I got the machine at home, I was thinking at first that I just needed to get used to what the pressure was. But truthfully, it was so strong that it was keeping me from being able to use it properly. I could not sleep because the air that was coming at me was blowing, blowing up my nose and into my face so strong that I was gagging. I could not sleep. When I tried to get back in touch with my health professional at that point, to let them know that I can't, I, I can't function this way because I'm getting no rest. And I was told, well, you have to use the machine at least six hours a night in order to be able to keep the machine. Otherwise, it's going to take, away, take it away from you, and you may not get another one. So I'm like, what, what? So I can't get any sleep because the wind is coming at me like a wind tunnel. And if, well, what do we do then? Because it could only be changed at the point of the prescription. So the doctor had to actually change it. And then someone else had to program it remotely from wherever they were. So I had no control over whatsoever. And even though I made it plain and clear that I was having a problem and that this was in fact keeping me from sleep, I wasn't even getting the sleep that I was getting before I had the machine. Now I'm not sleeping at all. But no one was responsive to me. And there wasn't anywhere for me to go because these were the people to do, to, to, to respond to that problem. But it was taking so long that I was miserable. Now I wasn't even getting the few hours of sleep that I had been getting. And I, I had found at the last time that, that 
uh, Mr. Amdur and I had, had met that there was a certain amount of weight gain that I didn't understand that came with this, this, this malady. And so I changed the way I ate. I, I, I'm, I was working with a nutritionist. As a matter of fact, my, my, my initial nutritionist is here. And so we talked about what was important to have in my diet and what was working well with the diabetes and these various things that I needed to do, that I did. But even if you do all the things you need to do outside of yourself, you're exercising, you're, you're, get, getting, you're allocating a certain amount of time to sleep, if you're not actually getting good sleep, none of it is going to matter. So I'm eating the right things, I'm exercising during the day, and I'm laying down to sleep dreading going to sleep because I know that for the next six hours, I'm going to have this wind gagging me, and then I had to get up in the morning and try it all again. And so I say all of this to say, even if the other parts are in place, I can tell you that I remember driving along and just trying to get home because I was exhausted, because I knew that once I got home, I'd be okay. But I would get all the way home and park in front of my home and go to sleep in the car and have my neighbors knocking on the window because they were afraid that there was something wrong with me. I remember driving parkways alone at night and being so tired that I had to pull over. The only night, honestly, I was afraid that I was going to die. It was, it, it, it was snowing like mad. I was going to sleep. I was going to sleep and I couldn't stop. So as soon as I could, I pulled over onto the shoulder and I said, if I could just get 15 minutes, if I could just get a power nap in, I'll be okay, I'll be all right to drive. And as soon as I pulled over, a policeman pulled over and uh, knocked on my window. And he told me I could not stay there. And I said, I've got to, I've got to rest. I'm not gonna make it home. I'm gonna kill myself or somebody else. I, 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 I was on an elevated roadway. I was afraid I was gonna go over the edge because when I was dozing, I felt myself swerving. I, that was the only night I was actually afraid I was going to die or kill someone else. But he would not give me 15 minutes. I, I, I know he had his rules to follow. But I was really afraid that night that I was not going to make it home. Because as soon as I got away from him and I was able to get over someplace else, I had to close my eyes. I needed to get some rest, and I certainly wasn't getting it. And it took a really long time. It took longer than it should have because it was not just my life. The same way our lives are not our own, we are involved with a lot of people, and what we do affects the lives of other people. I could have killed someone at any time. I was tired. I, I was taking no medications except for my diabetes. I manage, uh, I, I manage my treatment uh, by making sure that I'm active during the day. My mind is always active, and so I have difficulty getting to sleep in the first place. I am recently retired from the U.S. Postal Service, which was not my first job, but I worked for them for 31 years. But I'm still active in my community. I'm active in my church. I'm active in local politics. I have two small businesses. I'm busy all the time. My mind is always at work, but I make sure that I am doing uh, meditative talk downs in the evening. I, I pray at night, but truthfully, when I pray, it just sends my mind into all sorts of other things, so that doesn't calm me down enough to be able to rest. But I do meditative talk downs, um, which you can find online. And uh, I, I do exercise. I have lost a few pounds. I, uh, when I get up in the morning, I try to do a few minutes of cardio to raise my heart rate. Um, I do a little kickboxing, just a little because, you know, I don't want to have to hurt nobody. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he's going to mess with you now. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. But, uh, but, but I, I, I do try to manage what, what goes on with me without taking um, uh, painkillers and other things because uh, year, year, summer before last, I was thrown by a horse. And since then, I have uh, some issues that make it difficult for me to sleep. I can't rest in one position for too long because then that begins to hurt. So I travel with my CPAP machine and, uh, uh, and a heating blanket. 
which also plugs in near the bed, you know? But because I'm not taking anything for pain, every few minutes, I've got to toss, I've got to turn. Otherwise, I'm, I'm having difficulty resting. But once I get to sleep, you know, I've got six hours coming. But it, it takes a little while, it takes a little while. But I thank you so very much for your interest and for your participation in my health. Thank you. Thank you, Celeste. John from Virginia Beach, tell us about your experience. Well, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for having me here. Um, I believe I've had, in fact, I'm certain I've had uh, sleep apnea my, uh, probably most of my life. I uh, had issues falling asleep in high school. I used to dread chemistry class. Um, I am the guy who was a naval aviator, and it really became serious for me, and I didn't realize that I'd had sleep apnea, but I had to start to try to deal with the symptoms when, um, when I was flying and we were deployed and there came times when I, I would just be so tired that I'd be falling asleep in the airplane and so I went to the uh, flight surgeon and we had we, who was you know, I had one assigned to my squadron and they would give us basically anything we asked for so I could get uh, stimulants I guess it was speed uh, and would do that with regularity from them throughout my flying career I then also would get from them Ambien when we weren't deployed. You couldn't get Ambien when you're on the ship, but you could take it uh, when you were not actively deployed. So there's, I, combated, uh, I combated the symptoms of that for, or of sleep apnea for a long time like that. Uh, I had the unique experience of being sent to Iraq for 14 months with the Army. And uh, on the way over there, the, the standard, uh, open your mouth and let me see the back of your throat. And the guy goes, damn. And, he said, and I said, what? He said, do you snore? I said, yes, I've been told that I do. And he says, you need to get checked for sleep apnea. Um, I did after I got back, and I had it. But as I was still deployable, I got the oral device. And the oral device was really pretty effective um, to prevent snoring. I still have it, it's 10 years old. I'd like to figure out how to get a new one, but that's, that's an insurance issue. But it didn't really solve the sleep issues because I, um, I still was tired. And I, in fact, I told during the interview, I had a, it was a trauma for me, but I was a, with a, a four-star admiral, we were doing this VTC with Chief of Naval Operations and everybody in the world. So I'm sitting next to the Admiral on this VTC and I fall asleep and snort badly uh, in the middle of this meeting and nobody was happy with that. So I walked out of there and said, I gotta do something. And I knew I had it, so I went back, got another sleep study and they gave me uh, a CPAP. And I really liked the, sleep, the CPAP, but my partner did not. Um, and so that lasted for not a long time. I felt good using it, but the issues, you know, the the, she would just say, no, you don't need that. You need to lose weight. This is going to ruin our relationship. And, and so all those things, I stopped using it. And I went back to the oral device. And uh, in fact, the reason that I got uh, invited to this meeting was I can't use the oral device anymore because my dentist put a crown on and it doesn't fit. So I have, uh, I'm not doing any treatment right now and I feel it. Um, I feel the results. And so I'm going to endeavor to go find that uh, CPAP because I've moved a couple times, it's, it's put away somewhere, but I, I want to start using it. I hear the stories here, I hear about some of the things. When I came back uh, from Iraq, I had a massive AFib attack of hypertension. Um, all of the things that I think, you know, the, 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 the medical, medical community is treating, either via me, uh, medication or other means, that are really just outcomes of sleep apnea. Because I know when I use that machine, and it's working and it fits, uh, it's really helpful. Well, the, the final thing I'll say, not even with the machine, I got it, nobody ever showed me how to use it. I didn't know how to fit the mask, I don't know what the buttons mean, and I'm kind of a buttons guy, so what's this do? Uh, if, if the community out there, if that's one thing you could take away, people need to be trained on how to use those things. It's, um, I, I think there's a technique my mask, would, it, sometimes it leaks, and I try to fix it on my own. Um, but when it's working, I feel good. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, John. And last but not least, Erin Taylor from Colorado Springs. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the American Sleep Apnea Association for uh, inviting me here today and allowing me to tell my story. Uh, after the birth of my first child in 2010, uh, I had gestational diabetes with that pregnancy. And after that, I started to notice a lot of disparate uh, health outcomes that I thought were uh, unrelated. Um, I was having chronic pain and, and spasming in my back. I was extremely fatigued, which I chalked up to being up with a baby all the time. Um, I was starting to have memory and concentration problems at work. I was getting ill all the time. Uh, every time a cold or flu uh, would go through the community, I would get it. Um, I was snoring extremely badly, which I had never done before. Uh, and I didn't really know that all of these things could be connected and have a root cause. Um, several years later, my parents were both diagnosed with sleep apnea. One has obstructive and one has central sleep apnea. Um, but even then, I didn't quite put together that a lot of the things I was suffering from might have some common causality in, in sleep apnea. Um, Finally, so many of these symptoms got so bad in the summer of uh, 2017, and my parents at that point had talked to me a lot about sleep apnea and about using CPAP machines. So I decided to go in and talk to my doctor about it. And I have a wonderful primary care physician, and um, as soon as I mentioned it, she got me a, a survey, and I scored very high on the uh, the types of symptoms that might indicate I had sleep apnea. So uh, she recommended a sleep study. And uh, it took me about six weeks to get into a sleep center. So that was sort of the first barrier I faced is that I, I wanted to get a resolution immediately. And it was hard to get into that first sleep study because they were just overbooked with people needing uh, you know, solutions to sleep problems. Um, but I had my sleep study. I was diagnosed with severe sleep apnea. I stopped breathing about 50 times an hour, uh, the longest time for 40 seconds. And uh, so they actually put a CPAP on me halfway through the night and said, you know, try sleeping with this and see if it helps. And it did. Uh, I felt really remarkable after using the CPAP for several hours. I thought I got great sleep. So I was really excited to go home and start using my CPAP any day. And uh, it took a little bit longer than that. I didn't, uh, my sleep study was October 6th, and I think I finally got my CPAP on November 8th. So it was a month of knowing that there was a solution out there for me and knowing that I could be getting better sleep and not having it yet. And I think there had been some confusion about whether I should be going in for a second study to determine the, the level of pressure I needed or whether it was just slow processing with the insurance company. Um, but that was definitely a barrier to me getting started. Once I started using my CPAP machine, I really had a lot of success with it. I was, I was very lucky that they got the pressure setting correct right off the bat. Um, I didn't have too much trouble with the masks or, or any of the rest of it. Um, the biggest problem I had is, I guess, getting a good seal with the mask. And I use a full face mask. And um, when I first started using the CPAP, I was having a lot of trouble with getting bursts of air up in my face and in my eyes it, when the mask slipped when I moved positions at night. And so um, I ended up, I, I never could quite get the hang of adjusting the mask perfectly. Some nights it worked really well, and other nights it was just blasting me in the face with air a lot. Um, and when my CPAP arrived, it was mailed to me. I never had any contact whatsoever with anybody from the medical device company. So I never, you know, I had instructions on how to put it on, um, you know, things I could read, but I never had anyone showing me how to adjust the straps or, you know, talking to me about these things. So I, I agree with many of the other panelists. That's an area that could use a lot of help is sort of hands-on instruction on how to really use the CPAP appropriately. Um, I do use my CPAP seven nights a week um, for the entire time that I sleep. And one of the things that really helped me adapt to using the CPAP right away was an app 
that actually came with the CPAP device and their literature they included told me about it. Um, and this app, it tracks how long I use the CPAP every night, uh, how many apneas I have, how, uh, how many times I take the mask on and off, and uh, oh, and then how good the mask seal is. And it gives me a score. So I can look at that. I can get immediate feedback every night. I can look at patterns over time. And I've found that tremendously helpful. Getting that immediate feedback is so useful to me because it, it just lets me know that, yes, it is being effective. Oh, good, I only had two apneas last night. Oh, my mask seal wasn't great then, and I tightened these straps one way. Maybe I'll try doing something different the next time. So having that immediate feedback was incredibly helpful, and talking to a lot of the other patients here uh, who didn't have that, um, that, that app to give them feedback, um, I think it could help a lot of people to do that. So um, that was really most of my feedback. The only other thing I would really suggest is um, the process with the insurance could be a lot easier and more helpful. Um, I really have been working with the supplies that I first got with my CPAP because it's very expensive to buy the replacement masks and replacement hoses and they, um, my insurance won't cover them until I've met my deductible. So I, those are basically entirely out-of-pocket expenses for me. The other problem I'm running into is that my insurance does not want to pay for my sleep study. And I'm still in the process of, of appealing that. They're trying to charge me the full amount for the sleep study. Um, and that was supposed to be, you know, sort of pre-approved between the company and the, you know, the insurance and the medic and the sleep center. Uh, but it didn't, something did not get approved correctly, so I've been battling with that. So I, I would say, you know, those are some areas that could use some attention and uh, maybe some, some uh, changes in policies or procedures. But um, I want to thank you all for coming and listening uh, to our stories, and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Aaron, and to all of the panel for your courage and for sharing the, the successes and the challenges that you've encountered over time and still face ahead. I'll invite you to come back to your seats. I know we talked a little bit about whether to keep you up there, but let's uh, integrate you back into the room so we can focus all our attention uh, this direction. And while they're moving back to their seats, let's do a little bit of a poll. So, Eric, if we could do poll number eight. Get a sense of folks in the room and watching via the webcast. And I think we had 400 some people watching on Facebook in the morning session. I don't know how many might have come back after they had their lunch or breakfast, depending on uh, which coast they were on. But let us know which of the following have helped treat your sleep apnea. And for this one, you can check all that apply. And these are just the uh, airway-related treatments. We'll have another qu uh, polling question about medications you might be using and also supportive therapies. So this group. And I'll just say a little bit about the survey results. We've talked a, a bit about the survey all the way through. We had uh, two different survey populations, one that was older with more lived experience, longer treated, and that group had about 88% of them were using CPAP on average seven nights a week and on average six to eight hours a night. The other group that we recruited with the help of Ev Evidation, a uh, technology platform that was younger, uh, a little less severely affected, uh, a little less uh, treated in terms of their sleep apnea, was only using CPAP about 46% of the time, I think was the figure. So really interesting to see the differences uh, depending on you know, how you uh, come about the survey. And in this room, it seems like we're somewhere in between that, in this room and on, on the web. Um, we also saw a lot of a lot more people who had had an oral appliance in the past than were using it at present, 
and folks were only using their oral appliance on average three nights a week and for four to six hours a night. So um, just interesting data to kind of support what we heard from the panel and also what we're seeing here. So CPAP stories in, in the room, on the panel, already this morning, just now, through the survey and the open field comments. Boy, people love the benefit that they get from the CPAP when it's working well, or the APAP or the BiPAP uh, airway pressure when it's working well. But there are a lot of challenges with getting that positive benefit and effect. Um, Phyllis, coming from a caregiver perspective. Right, so I wanted to speak because I haven't heard the caregiver's perspective um, at all today. And when my husband um, first got his CPAC, which I was thrilled about because I was well aware of the sleep issues he was having and I was quite frightened and was, did not want to be a widow at such an early age, um, his CPAC was so disturbing that I suddenly develop sleep issues. And, and I don't mean that in a light manner. And I went on to um, communities to find out what other spouses were doing. And I was stunned by the amount of um, negativity towards the caregiver. That how dare you, I mean, I didn't, I didn't put a comment, I was reading comments. How dare you, your spouse finally is getting some sleep and you're complaining. And what they didn't understand was that I wasn't getting any sleep now. And um, what he shared before this morning was that he actually went out and bought me these industrial grade earmuffs. So now I could only sleep on my back, I couldn't roll over. And we used to make a joke that was Darth Vader and Princess Leia sleeping at night. <laughs> and you know, we would, we would tell our friends that they joke, but it wasn't a joking matter. So I just wanna point out to that as we have this discussion, that there is a serious consequence often for the caregiver with the, the CPAC. Well, we heard a lot in the survey about, okay, we're sleeping in separate rooms now or separate ends of the house maybe um, to accommodate that. I see Teresa's got her hand up. I was a sleep technician for many years and the what you've just described is, is not totally rare, but it does happen. And my theory is, you didn't like it when he was snoring, I'm sure that kept you awake as well. But now your job is over. You were used to nudging him to wake him up. And sometimes I do believe that because your job has finished now, it's left you a little bit uneasy about who's sleeping next to you. Is he going to breathe? Is this really going to work? And I, I, I sense that anxiety. I did sense that for many patients' spouses. But there was one more thing that I wanted to talk about. I'm not a sleep tech anymore, but I did it since the 70s. And uh, the one thing that I don't think that people have thought about is the stigma and maybe the stigma of having this disorder has uh, diminished because it's more commonplace now to have a CPAP. However, the stigma of, of wearing it and having to deal with it and has not really left completely. I think that some people are still a little bit embarrassed. But the stigma of, geez, he's so lazy, he won't do anything. He won't get up and play with the kids. When uh, somebody said about that the house was nicer, you know, it, well, that, you know, the person has probably just, you know, gone through a lot. A lot of the patients that I saw went through a lot of getting fired at work because they were falling asleep, they were not performing like they should. So there's so many other issues besides the actual health. So this stigma, oh, he's lazy, he's a rotten father, he won't get up and play with the kids. You know, there's so many other things that go along with this because it's sort of an invisible thing. 
you think about it, you know, you don't, you can't look at somebody and say, oh, sleep apnea, you know? So anyway, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I think your, your point about the stigma is also a barrier to diagnosis for some people, that the um, idea that, oh my gosh, if, if I do have sleep apnea, I'll have to wear one of those horrible masks, keep people from doing that. I had a conversation with somebody yesterday who said that very thing. Um, and so all of the health consequences we've heard about may layer on just out of fear of the, you know, the way to go about primary treatment. Will, you wanted to build on that. I was looking at li the list, and I thought, I have had every one of those. <laughs> and unlike a lot of people, I started at the bottom. You know, tonsillectomy, and then went to deviated septum, then I had a surgery, uh, then I thought, there's no way I'm going to do a CPAP, so I went with the oral appliance, uh, and eventually, um, now I'm a CPAP user and, and a, a very adherent one. And because I think, you know, you know, everyone knows you'll get sick if you don't take care of it. My father had all the classic symptoms, um, and uh, I realized that, so that's why I do it. One of the things that I've just wanted to mention is the frustration with the, the pace of innovation in the world. Because um, if you really think about it, the CPAP machine is, is quite old, probably 20, 25 years old. And the APAPs and that kind of stuff are a refinement of that. But, but you don't see any kind of um, new things coming out. And I just refuse to believe that uh, there aren't answers you know, that, that can come uh, from different sources. And so um, I don't know what's driven the innovation out. I think it's incrementalism. Uh, you know, making something smaller and faster and lighter uh, works to a certain point. But as the survey results show, that you don't, you don't get perfect um, results. People are still tired even if they use uh, PAP machines. Uh, and they're still tired even if they use the oral appliances. So, so the, the, the status of the, the treatment options today, I think, are, are stagnated for some reason. And I, I just, I get frustrated with it. And I, I talk to a lot of patients, and they, they'd like other kinds of alternatives to come along. Um, and so far, um, it's been a very incremental thing. Uh, we had that the, the, the tongue stimulation uh, come along, and of course that, that had to cost a ton of money, for, you know, to be able to get that through. Um, so, for what it's worth, um, I don't know what it's going to take to get more things in the pipeline, um, but I'm hopeful. And while I'm hopeful, I'm still wearing my CPAP machine. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Somebody else had their hand up, I think. Hello, I, I had both uh, an observation and a question. The observation is that on that list, there's a, not an alternative for what might broadly be called behavioral therapy, or at least in, in my particular case, the obstructive apneas are more frequent when I'm supine versus on my side. So one of the therapies is to try to sleep more on my side. And I'm, that, I'm not unique in that, it's actually common. So that could be added as another answer to the question, positional sleeping. But then, and then my question, which is, um, I, I get the impression both from my own doctors and this meeting that, you know, that generally the objective the objective should be to um, have CPAP treatment, that you would be healthier if you had CPAP treatment, if you just tried hard enough, you'd be successful. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what, uh, what it, whether it is the case that truly you just try hard enough and you'll succeed. The data that I've read suggests a large fraction, perhaps 50% of patients are non-compliant with CPAP. And I, I wish there, I'm wondering, so the question format of it would be, well, what is understood about the non-compliance beyond that if you have more education and a, a less noisy device and so on, maybe you'll be more compliant. Is there any um, insight as to whether there might be a class of patients who are non-compliant because the therapy is inappropriate for them? Carl, can I uh, tackle that? 
tap your knowledge of that literature? Yeah, you raise a, a, a great a great question about how do we improve. You, you raise a great question about how how do we improve CPAP adherence, and I think historically what we've done is we've looked at the patient and what they could do differently. I think we also need to look at the healthcare system and how do we provide the initial education, the initial support, and I think literature is pretty clear if we provide that good support early on in those first several days to help them troubleshoot any problems they have and um, overcome any problems, that that can be really helpful. So we've done, the, the, the CPAP adherence uh, interventions are pretty clear that we can improve adherence by a couple hours per night if we can provide that kind of um, education. I think one of the most important things too is making sure that people understand what the benefits are. Oftentimes it's a it's experience of what are the benefits of therapy versus the cons of therapy. So help, helping people get to um, use a, a good CPAP trial, I think is really important. Aaron, I appreciated your comments uh, in the, on the panel about how you adjusted to using the CPAP. And I wonder if there's anybody else who could offer some suggestions uh, about how to be more successful and not to put the blame on the patient if it doesn't work out. Maybe it's not the right treatment, but to maybe give it the best shot you can. Rick, I know you're a big well, I'm Avenger, a, I, right? I, I love Avenger. CPAP. I, I got, as I said, I got diagnosed in 92 and I've used my CPAP pretty much almost every day since then and through a variety of machines, variety of masks and all of that. But in the beginning, we were talking, Teresa, you were talking about the stigma of it and what people think. And when I looked at that first VHS tape, when the doctor showed it to me in his office, remember this was in the early 90s, and he came back in, and I was sitting there with my wife at the time, and we looked at it, he comes back in, he said, what do you think? And I looked at him word for word, said, what are you effing nuts if you think I'm gonna wear that? And he kind of looked, he smiled, he said, yeah, I get that a lot. But how we put it in perspective, and this is again part of the education that Carl was talking about getting used to and having people trained, what you were talking about up there. And he had said to me, you have to look at it, it's very, the, the CPAP treatment is actually very simple treatment when you break it down. People who wear glasses in here, what do you do first thing in the morning? You get up and you put your glasses on. The end of the day when you're done, you take them off. Your treatment is done for your eyes for the day. CPAP is exactly the same way. You lay down, I have my mask hanging on a hook right next to the bed. I lay down, I put my mask on, I go to sleep, I take it off, my treatment's done for the day. And breaking it down into simple terms really, really helped. That it was just a simple part of the treatment, it was a few hours a day, he said, you don't have to carry your machine around with you all day. You don't have to hold it over your shoulder, you don't have to wear your mask on, you know? And uh, I, I mean, I love it, it's been great for me. As you heard, it was great for my family. One of my wife's now favorite expressions before bed is, put your mask on, <laughs> you know, so she makes sure that I, um, that I have it on. But when we can get it down, you get the education when they know how helpful it is, when they know how simple the treatment is, then we have to remember that CPAP treatment, when used properly, is almost 100% effective with no side effects. And when we can realize that and start digesting that information, it helps our brain and our body accept the use of the CPAP machine because we have to get used to strapping something on and getting our bodies used to it. And that comes from intervention, that comes from knowledge, that comes from the training all before, not just mailing somebody a machine and saying, here you go, here's how you turn it on, good luck. to get their treatment or get their titration study, there's very little time to talk and educate a patient. I mean, there's so much coming at them. You're putting this on them. You know, they're gonna have more things on their hair, whatever. I mean, it's, it's really a lot. And I became so um, discouraged, I guess it was, back in, you know, a couple decades ago, that we couldn't, as sleep professionals, we couldn't help these people beyond them being right there in the sleep lab. We couldn't give them the education in that time that they deserved. 
and yet there was no other thing. It's just like he said, you know, they would mail them their CPAP and that was that. Here, put this on. Well, first of all, if you don't educate a patient about the physiology of the upper airway while awake, when it's nice and open, and while asleep, that it's going to close. They're not going to understand this bolus of air coming to the back of their throat, but if you explain that and you try to get them to relax and they accept the pressure in the back of the airway, you're gonna have more success. So I tried very hard to at least get that in, you know, before I would put them to bed and lights out. But the time has come for education to be in another setting, it, not the same night when they're having all this done, but another time, I mean, a time to, for them to absorb it and digest it. I think that a sleep apnea patient deserves it. This is why they're all, well, there's so many in the closets because they just can't get used to that. I mean, it's very difficult, but if you relax and you breathe with it and not against it. And if you give that education to the patient, nine times out of 10, they're sleeping very well with it. And I know from my colleagues in the sleep labs are the best people to bring that education because they understand the upper airway physiology. They understand and they can teach that. Now, I went around the country. I went to work for a device manufacturer uh, later on in my career. And I was going around the country educating sleep techs on how to educate patients the, the appropriate way, the way the patient needs to be taught. And it was called adherence and compliance and all this. Well, lo and behold, this turned into something very ugly down the road. Compliance was used to take the machine away if they weren't using it for X amount of hours. Well, they couldn't because they weren't educated. And I think that everybody deserves education to their treatment. That's all I have to say. Thanks, <laughs> Teresa. Whoop. You bring up important points, and we're going to dive into those a little more deeply. Maybe I, I don't may or may not be touching on that. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Shelley. Testing, testing, okay. I just want to echo something that Dr. Shelley Burson started out with earlier in the morning. She talked about the lack of education on all the different factors, not just the patients. We're, hearing to, we're here to gay, basically to educate each other, but the education for those of us who didn't even know what sleep, sleep apnea is, that education starts in the doctor's office. It continues in the durable medical equipment place and the sleep app at the sleep lab. What I think we are all the victims of is siloed medical care. That each of these things are so fragmented and separate that we, the patients, are not at the forefront. If you have a doctor who doesn't know what the equipment is, won't touch it and won't know how to use it, don't know, doesn't know how to set it. You have a durable medical equipment company who can only spend five minutes with the patient, won't train them, won't teach them, and frankly don't know what they're doing to begin with. And a sleep technician who doesn't have time during his study to be able to deal with, where does the patient survive in this mess? They are all so busy, si and then on top of that, the, the, the healthcare insurance companies that come in and then cap off what the opportunities were. You could be educated. You know, don't you have, I mean, I don't know how everybody's health plan is, but my plan accommodates diabetes training. I don't have it, but they accommodate diabetes training and nutrition training as part of their uh, overall health coverage. Why doesn't that exist in the sleep apnea area? In the sleep area. In the sleep area, thank you in the sleep area. We are, because of the fragment, fragmented approach, the patients are losing. So I would suggest to this organization, find a way to break down the silos. And if, and if there's anything we as patients can do to assist, I would highly, you know, ask us. I'm sure we can all write to whoever or whatever. Joelle, I couldn't say it any better. Uh, this almost has to go way back in time. We have to start just with the training of the healthcare field. You got to remember th this is a profession that's very traditional and very 
rigid and, and methodical in how they approach the science. And quite honestly, they've been taught that the amount of work you do on as little sleep is a badge of honor. Sleep deprivation is a badge of honor. And changing that mindset is a behavior change. And that's throughout all of society. We're learning in corporate world, the private world, uh, that w once people start respecting sleep, let alone their sleep apnea, their quality of life goes up. So the diabetes community, it has taken them 10 years to get diabetes health education reimbursable. We know it. Everybody knows it. This should become a one-year thing. We have a partner here in the room, uh, Alan Boone from the American Academy of Sleep Technologists, and Teresa, who used to be a part of that. Um, these people are going to be out of jobs soon because, quite honestly, the labs or, or the Medicare and CMS are saying, you need to have home sleep studies. We don't need these people. These people are qualified. They're trained. They need to be out in the field, in the primary care, in the family physician, with the pediatricians, helping us learn how to use these machines. Um, to back up uh, for a couple other thoughts I just wanted to scatter in here that I had on my mind, um, a lot of people have anxiety about wearing the mask and have the claustrophobia. I have to tell you, my biggest anxiety, and Paul mentioned this earlier, was not having power. When, when that hurricane was coming last summer, I got my family and we got in the car and fortunately we, we, we could afford to do that and we got up to high ground, not because I was scared of the storm, I'd been through Hurricane Andrew, but I knew the aftermath and the ramifications of, of, of a natural disaster. I knew there would be no power back for about a month before where I lived. Uh, and I will not go a day. I've not slept a day, a nap, or anything in 10 years without this. Maybe once on an airplane, so tired I've fallen asleep and I wake myself up. And I can walk up and down aisles on airplanes and diagnose half the airplane. When you, <laughs> and I'm sure y'all, everybody in this room knows what I'm talking about. Um, so with, with that being said, uh, to come back to your, your point about the silos, Joel, yeah, absolutely. If the sleep component is not factored in, whether it's sleep apnea, everyone used to say, well, you think everybody has sleep apnea? And I, I said, no, that's not the case. I just know that if the sleep component is not factored in, you don't have the whole story. When I talk to some of the, the top geneticists out of the NIH or, or all the top leaders in this world, and, and they start telling me, we've developed cardiovascular protocols and interventions and, and drugs and, and all sorts of policies based on a, pa a person's life, two thirds of their life. That two thirds is while they're conscious. They have not factored in those other eight hours. Uh, and that's not having the whole story. That's not good science. So, Melissa, you want to say something? My fellow narcolepsy advocate. <laughs> so, actually, speaking here as a doctor's daughter, uh, my dad's a general pediatrician. My grandfather um, was an old school GP, the kind who could deliver your baby, set your bones, and uh, give you the antibiotics. Uh, in fact, he remembers before antibiotics. Um, yeah, he's he is turning 91 in September. So, um, but the thing is, when you could do everything from antibiotics to setting somebody's leg to delivering someone's baby, it also meant you had more time in the office and you knew your patient better. Now, sleep is a specialty, so it has to get referred. And so, for a general practitioner. Uh, I was at the sleep meeting this past week, um, it, the big National Sleep Foundation, all that, um, up in Baltimore. Anyway, at some point they were talking, and it turns out that the average amount of education that a medical student gets on sleep is 18 minutes. Wow. That's a medical student. A resident, and by the time they're a resident, they're treating patients, uh, the average amount of time a resident gets on sleep is three hours. That's all sleep. That is everything from sleep ar architecture to this is what healthy sleep looks like in kids and this is what healthy sleep looks like in adults to sleep apnea and narcolepsy and comorbidity. Three hours. Um, and that's, while, the, like I said, while they're treating patients. The other thing is residents are sleep deprived. Um, they've gotten better about it now. You can only work residents in most specialties 80 hours a week only. Um, I always tell the joke, my dad had been awake for 56 hours when I was born, straight, with no sleep, um, because he pulled a 36-hour call shift as a resident 
don't have kids in residency, if any of you are going to go into that. Um, <laughs> he had pulled a 36-hour call shift, come home. My mom was in labor, so he wasn't getting any sleep, and then I took a while to arrive. Um, he, when he was working, it was 120 hours it were normal weeks. Okay, if you're sleep-deprived, your memory is not good, and um, also you're probably not remembering that three hours you're getting on sleep. So we need to do better uh, as, a, as a nation on um, sleep education. It's a third of our lives. It should probably be at least an eighth of the education. Uh, I think that's a, a great place to maybe shift gears a little bit. We want to, I'm going to, if, okay, if it's okay, I want to make sure we get to another topic before the break. Um, and actually, it involves the question you asked earlier about sleep positioning. If we could have the next poll, please. Lots of issues have come up where, um, you know, not in a position to change everything from medical education to the way payers deal with things in the fragmented healthcare system. But there are some medications I know that many of you are using, and we've got members of the uh, FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research here who are interested in in what types of medications you're using in addition to the other things. And we saw in the survey that even though, um, particularly in the, in the survey population that was reached that was high, uh, very um, faithful users of their CPAP, they still had a lot of fatigue and daytime sleepiness. We talked about that in the morning. Um, so the, the CPAP was helping their sleep, but not necessarily eliminating all of their symptoms. And Dr. Burson mentioned a number of different medications that are used. There are a lot of comorbidities we talked about this morning. So a number of different medications um, that are sometimes used to treat those coexisting conditions and sometimes used to address the symptoms of sleep apnea itself. There we go. Others? So how many folks uh, are using, it's hard to tell whether this is all in the room or some by the webcast. Um, Dr. Burson also mentioned the, the real sort of background need to treat allergies and be aware of different allergies. How many people find that allergies are, you know, a big contributor potentially to the, the problems they experience just by kind of a show of hands? And, you know, a number of different ways to certainly deal with those, including the medications, some of which are up here, things like neti pot and, uh, you know, rinses and, and that kind of thing, environmental influences and particularly here in D.C. where we have lots of seasonal allergies, uh, important contributors. Um, Paul mentioned his use of NuVigil and some of the wakefulness agents. Other people in the survey talked about stimulants and ways to keep themselves awake up to and including, you know, lots of caffeine. For how many people has that an important uh, maybe rescue uh, strategy at different times or something you do sort of perpetually just by show of hands. What are the types of, how do you make that benefit risk? Paul addressed this in his comments of knowing if I take it, it might have some effect on my sleep that night. Would anybody be willing to share maybe how they make that calculation or what benefits they're hoping to get versus what side effects or um, uh, you know, downsides they're willing to accept in order to get that benefit. So we will. Uh, the benefits of taking a, a, a decongestant. So any, any of the yeah, so I have a, you know, having had this for 25 years, I have a whole routine and if I can't breathe through my nose, I can't wear my mask. And so I have to go to plan B, which is either take a um, uh, decongestant or um, if I was smart, I'd be taking a, a nasal uh, cortical steroid um, on a regular basis. And then if that doesn't work, then I have to go to plan C, which is take a more strong uh, nasal decongestant. And then that, I know that in two days I'll have a problem because you know you get the rebound effect 
and so but it's a calculated risk that I have to take. And then, um, and then if I have a problem that's really complicated, you know, I might have to take uh, my Adderall, you know, where um, you know I have to think that day and and be on. And so I have this kind of strategic way of taking all these things so that it, it I can get through my day. Hey, does that resonate with anybody else? A strategic sort of arsenal of options that you deploy as needed. Paul, I see you shaking. I, I just want to add um, one more medication that's yeah. not on your list, and there are um, nasal antihistamine sprays. Um, like at, uh, Astelin, uh -huh. or, uh, that, and there's actually a combo, it's called Dimista, which is um, it's a nasal steroid plus an antihistamine, so that might be another option. And my pet peeve here is go get your allergies tested, see what you're allergic to, because tried and true is allergy shots, immunotherapy, it's been around for a really long time, get immunized against the things to which you're allergic, and your nasal congestion may improve that way also. Other comments about medications? All right, now we're going to get to the positional sleeping. Uh, poll number 10 about supportive strategies. These are big things uh, that can contribute positive benefits without maybe uh, that all of us try to do toward being more healthful and living in wellness. And I want to be sure we, we talk about weight loss. Celeste, you brought this up in, in your comments uh, that often weight gain accompanies uh, sleep apnea as kind of a cycle of not being as active or not getting as good a sleep, not feeling as well to be physically active. And then once that happens, it's harder to be physically active because you weigh more and it's, it's just more challenging. Um, and we talked last night when the panel met about some of the expectations around weight loss once you go on to CPAP. And um, Carl, you mentioned that, that the research so far yet isn't showing that there's weight loss associated with CPAP, even though sometimes uh, we would expect to see that. Yeah, do you want to mention anything about that? I think one of the things that, that I do and that I've used in a lot of my presentations, which I've learned since I've been with the association, is preparing your bedroom for sleep. And there's a lot of ways that people don't realize within your own environment and helping manage your sleep, which is helping manage your sleep apnea, we all have all our gadgets in the bedrooms. And we have the little light on from the cable box and the little light on from the TV for our chargers. And you'd be surprised, sometimes go in your bedrooms, turn off your lights, and see how bright that room is. Your room should be dark. You need to set that. Then it's also part of what we have on our website, the Ten Commandments of Sleep. <laughs> Use your bedroom for what a bedroom's supposed to be used for. Okay, don't do other activities in there, and you will be able to manage your sleep a little bit better. You start getting yourself on a routine. You know you go to bed at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock or whenever it is, and you sleep till a certain amount of time. And all these little factors really help, and I encourage you, if you've never seen it, it's actually pretty good, look at the Ten Commandments of Good Sleep. And by doing those, which of course, and a lot of them are on there, the weight loss, the alcohol, that type of thing. But some of the little things that, that we don't consider, and it's on, is it still on the site, the Ten Commandments of Sleep? It's a great, it's a great thing to look at. Carl? Yeah, I, I, th I think with the relationship between sleep apnea and uh, weight loss, when people are waking up for 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 times per hour, um, some of the research shows Dr. Eve Van Cotter, who was the keynote speaker at APSS this past uh, week, Sure. Um, what, what she showed was that you can actually bring on diabetes in normal folks by just sleep depriving them. And so you think about the average sleep apnea patient who's having 10 and 20 and 30 arousals. Um, so you'd think if you reversed that, there'd be a natural kind of reset of the metabolism and weight loss. And unfortunately, what we're seeing with CPAP patients is we're not necessarily seeing that the weight naturally comes off. 
And I think the field was relatively surprised um, by that. So some of the meta-analyses now show that it doesn't look like um, with CPAP therapy that not only does weight not come off, but there may be small weight gain associated with CPAP use, which is um, an unfortunate finding. But I think it also speaks to the fact of how important a focus is on the behavioral recommendations um, to file to, to uh, engage in, in good good health behaviors and 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 diet. What are some other strategies people are using? Um, see up there is certainly the sleep positioning, as mentioned uh, by the gentleman in the back, Paul. Low tech, low expense. I tape my mouth shut with a Band-Aid. <laughs> and the reason the Band-Aid, because it's got the gauze in the middle and my lips are sensitive. The reason for the Band-Aid is because it's got that gauze in the center that goes over the lips so I won't peel skin off my lips. But I take meds that create dry mouth. And, um, you know, I probably would breathe through my mouth at every night, part of the night, if I didn't do this. Wanted to add another ENT anatomy comment here as well with an anecdotal observation and um, that if you have a deviated nasal septum, there is some evidence to suggest that if you sleep with the deviated side down, the obstructed side down. It will allow a larger airway on the good side to be up and your sleeping should be better. If you do a sleep study in the lab, they should be able to track not only supine on your back, but also right and left. And sometimes they get a little bit lazy and they say supine and non-supine. As an ear, nose, and throat doctor, I want to know right or left. So the cheap, easy test is just plug your nose and see which side is more blocked or not. So that at least if you have to sleep without your machine or anything, at least sleep with the bad side down. I'm sorry I'm talking so much since this is not my condition, but... Um, I did, since um, uh, the man with the ingenious Band-Aid solution, which I had never even thought of, that is clever, um, brought up dry mouth. Um, I didn't say anything when you were talking about drugs, but um, because we do have patients who have both OSA and narcolepsy, and <laughs> some of the drugs for narcolepsy, particularly um, Xyrem, is a uh, <laughs> respiratory depressant, um, so treating somebody with um, some of the medications can be tricky with the comorbid conditions, and we need better and more options, particularly in terms of sleep consolidation drugs for narcolepsy that don't also depress respiration for people with sleep apnea. Um, and I know that Xyrem has been used in some sleep apnea patients, and so I'm sure doctors can talk to that. But... That's a need, and um, we need pediatric stuff that is designated for pediatric patients. We need stuff for excessive daytime sleepiness that's designated for pediatric patients, and the thing the FDA can do is incentivize it so that we are getting drug companies to, nobody wants to do tests on kids. You have to incentivize it, and the FDA can work with um, policymakers to uh, encourage drug companies to do that testing. If the I've been on off-label drugs for years for excessive daytime sleepiness. A lot of our patients that have both are on it, and we need better ways to deal with that with pediatrics, and that's something the FDA can do. Thanks for that. Yeah, Adam, did you want to comment to that? We haven't talked much about the kids and the treatment uh, aspect. 
which you know is dear to my heart. I do. <laughs> um, so there's one thing that I, I beg of the entire healthcare community, and it's really pandemic at this point, but before any child's written a script for Adderall or Ritalin for any sort of ADHD diagnosis, if they're not having a sleep workup, um, that doctor is not practicing at the top of his license. So, you know, that, that it's not the child's fault that they're bouncing off the walls. It's not the child's fault that they're bedwetting. That's, that's, that's the body's way of saving them and waking them up at night. Um, and we have to start teaching the mommies and the grandmas and, 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 the, and, the, and the women who are in their third trimester of pregnancies about what to expect when you're, not, when you're expecting. Because uh, there's a lot of stuff that we know about sleep that's not in those books that the laymans are reading. Um, that's more of a public health sort of comment, but it comes back to every pediatrician scares every mother and every father about sudden infant death syndrome. And we're not saying that all sudden infant death syndrome is pediatric sleep apnea, but a good percentage of it is. And really the only difference is, is that a one-year-old baby can roll over and catch its breath. And we all take down our red flags, you know, after one when that baby can roll over, but that's really when our guards got to go back up. Um, it's just, you know, I, I caught my child sleeping in child's pose. She was naturally already protecting herself. She had her butt up in the air, letting her tongue fall forward, and she was forcing air into her diaphragm. And once we teach mommies to look for that and that a child's wedged up against the bed, these are call, telltale red flags for a sleep disorder breathing issue. And that's just got to become part of Maine society. It's got to become part of the FDA. It's got to become part of everything, the healthcare, learning healthcare systems, uh, our school systems, you name it. Um, so with that being said, that's about all I got.